What a joy it is to see you. I'm Pastor Parnell M. Lovelace, Jr., and what an honor it is to stand before you once again as we share through the Word of God. The Lord has been good to us, hasn't he? He has been so faithful, and we love him with all of our heart, our soul, our strength, and our mind. I give him praise. Thank God for our beloved pastor and all the pastors and all the team here. God is doing some awesome things here in Bridgeway, and we're grateful. We're humbled by it. And I know he's got something good in store for us today. So let's get ready to receive and open our hearts to everything that the Father has for us. So that by the time the one standing before you has finished sharing and we walk out of these doors, we will leave transformed by the power of a living God. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's pray together all over the room. Father, thank you for this, your beloved and my dear ones that are here as always, I give you praise. I thank you for the blessing, the joy of being with each and every one of them. Would you now, O oh God, give us clarity of thought, continuity of thinking, accuracy of the text. Help your servant to share in such a way that even a child would be able to understand and embrace the powerful truth and revelation that is given to us through Scripture. And we'll be careful to give you all of the glory, all of the honor. Yes, it belongs to you. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Smile at somebody and say, I'm so happy to see you. I don't know what to do with myself. Go ahead and tell them that. <laughs> I'm so happy to see you. Praise the Lord. I invite you to open your Bibles, if you will, please, to survey Job, chapter 3. That's Job in Hebrew. Survey Job in chapter 3. As we look at the text, we are taking up the subject of understanding this year of wisdom what it means to have wisdom, to be people of wisdom. We're focusing this whole year on the year of wisdom or the subject matter of wisdom. And specifically, we're taking up this first book, the book of Job, the book of Job, Survey Job, as we are examining what it means to suffer. What is the context? What is the reality? Why? suffering. Why do people suffer? Why do we ourselves suffer? Why do we have loved ones that suffer? If you take along with uh, your Bible, the brochure that you received when you came in, there's a fill-in inside that brochure. I want you to fill these words in, if you will, please, as we begin our time. Just write this in, if you will. It's, here's your first fill-in, not. It's not about, the second word is us. It's not about us. Even when we speak about suffering, we're going to find out ultimately, although we are the ones who are experiencing the suffering, or we have family members or friends or loved ones that are suffering, ultimately, beloved, it is not about us. There's a deeper meaning. There is a deeper purpose. There is something that is to be gleaned in everything. Regardless of what it is that we see, I submit to you, God is not absent. God has not removed himself. He's very present. He's ever present, even in times of trouble. Questions are asked, why are we here? Where is the meaning in this world? What is the purpose? Have you ever asked that? What is the purpose of my life? We tend not to really delve deeply into those questions until something tragic happens. When something bad happens, then we begin to reflect on these thoughts even the more so. We begin to think and question what is the grand view or what is the 
big picture of life. I often have to ask my question, myself this question, why do I wait until something terrible happens before I reflect upon that? Why is it that something tragic must happen? And then I begin to ask myself personally, what is the deeper meaning? Why am I here? Why all of this? When we look at Job, Job asked those same questions. And we're going to observe even as he struggles through these questions, we ourselves possibly can identify with them. Yet, we have something that Job himself did not have at his disposal. Job had no idea that at the end of the account of his life, that things would be better for him than they were at the beginning. Had no idea. He was just walking through day by day, from day to night to day to night, from day to night. He had no idea. But you and I, brothers and sisters, we have at our disposal something that Job did not, and that is the volume of the book. We've got the Word of God from Genesis to Revelation. And I got some good news for you. I read the end of the chapter, the end of the book, <laughs> and we win. We really do. It may seem that things are difficult and things are challenging. And some of us in this very room, this very moment, are going through the most painful time that you've ever experienced in your entire life. Others of you are living from the shadows of the past that malign and impede you from moving forward into the things that truly God has for you. But you have the Word of God, the volume of the book that lets us know everything's going to be all right. Everything's going to be all right. We will observe as we go through our time together Job's observation. Then we're going to look secondly at our own observation. But we're not going to stop there. We're going to jump into what God's observation is. What does God say about it? And we're going to find out that our lives indeed are not for our glory, but for God's glory. We're going to find out that we are designed with purpose and with meaning. Not only that, we will observe that we are equipped for every good work, and we are designed to bear much fruit, much fruit for the kingdom of God. And our lives are full of potential. Regardless of what's going on, we just have to change how we look through the lenses of our life. And we'll find out that our lives indeed are full of potential. And then lastly, we've got to come to the understanding that Jesus uses everything. I repeat myself. Jesus uses everything in our lives to advance his kingdom. Everything. The good, the bad, and even the ugly. When it all shakes out, God's kingdom will be advanced. God's kingdom will go forward. Let's look at our text here in Job 3. And let's observe for a few moments Job's, Job's observation. Here's the observation of Job. He begins to lament in this first passage that we'll read verses 1 through 3, and then we'll skip down to verse 10 through 19. And notice here that in the midst of his suffering, he begins to lament his even his birth and his existence, even to the place that he seeks refuge in death. Notice what it says, that after this, Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. And Job said, let the day perish on which I was born, and the night that said, a man is conceived. 
A baby has come, a child has come. Because it did not shut the doors of my mother's womb, nor hide trouble from my eyes. Why did I not die at birth? Come out from the womb and expire. Why did the knees receive me? This is a reference to the midwife who would posture herself on her knees in order to receive the baby or to receive the child. He says, why did the knees receive me? Or why the breasts that I should nurse? For when I would have lain down and been quiet, I would have slept. It's a reference to death. I would have slept. Then I would have been at rest with the kings and the counselors of the earth who rebuilt ruins for themselves or with princes who had gold, who would fill their houses with silver. Or oh, why was I not as hidden as a stillborn child, as infants who never see the light? There the wicked, he's talking about in death, there the wicked cease from troubling, and there the weary are at rest. There the prisoners are at ease together, they hear not the voice of the taskmaster. The small and the great are there, and the slave is free from the master. Do you catch the state of mind that Job is in? Do you see the anguish that he's dealing with? What a sad commentary that a person, though righteous, though seen in the eyes of God as a righteous man, yet within his own mind, we see him coming to a place of utter despair. We'll see in a moment that it is progressive. Just a chapter earlier, it seemed like he was a little bit stronger. But you've been through some things. You know how it works. That you might start out a little strong, but then as the days wear on, and suffering continues, it begins to work upon the mind. It begins to malign even our faith. We start out well, but the longer the thing goes, the longer the challenge presents itself, the more we begin to question. And even if not careful, beginning to shift even on what we think in regards to God. Job's observation of life and death clearly is skewed. He has an observation of life that I wish I had never been born. I wish that the process, the announcement of my birth had never taken place. It, it, it directly counters that. It directly counters that which most people, most of us celebrate, and that is the birth of a child. It, it, it counters that thinking. This, this, this week, my, my godson, uh, who lives in New York, he and his wife, had their first baby, their first child. And they were all excited. And I must confess, over the last four months, five months, I've been doing my best to convince them to squeeze my name in there some kind of way. <laughs> And they were celebrating this baby. They were celebrating this child. And, and it, was all, it was so exciting. And I thought to myself, how beautiful. I, I cannot wait to go there this summer and spend a day or two there and see uh, my godson, whom I held in my arms 28 years ago as a baby. My godson, whom his, his father was my roommate at Oral Roberts University. I was his father and mother's best man in their wedding. And, and, and to see him now with the family, it, it, it touches my heart. It blesses me. I'm excited about it. What a direct counter to what we see with Job, where Job says, things are so bad. I'm going through so much. I wish that my date of birth had not even appeared on the calendar. I wish that I had never been born. His observation of life and death is skewed. He looks through the wrong lenses. However, here's the good news. Remember that the book of Job and Job's account is not about Job. It's about God. 
It's not about how strong Job is. It's about how strong God is. It's not even about how faithful Job is. It's about how faithful God is. That, that's, that's really what it is. It's not about us. It's not about us. It's about God. And it is this idea and, and this belief and this reality, it is this relational reality that affirms, hear me, that Job, like us, cannot and will not blaspheme God. Because God is so committed to Job and connected to Job that regardless of what goes down, God won't fail him. That's the same for us. The relational reality says, regardless of how bad things seem to go or be, you cannot and I cannot be taken out of the hands of a loving God. That's how much he loves us. Job's observation continues in Job 7, verses 6 through 10. Listen to what he says. My days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle. We'll talk about that in a moment. It has nothing to do with Uber or Lyft. <laughs> My days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle and come to their end without hope. Remember that my life is a breath. My eye will never again see good. The eye of him who sees me will behold me no more. While your eyes are on me, I shall be gone. And the cloud fades and vanishes. So he who goes down to Sheol does not come up. He returns no more to his house, nor does his place know him anymore. In essence, here's his observation. Life is short. Life is short. It's just a, a, a vapor. It, it, in essence, it, it's here, here today, gone tomorrow. It, it's, it's real short. And if it's short, here's the question that inevitably he's asking, what does it matter? If life is short, what does it really matter? If I'm not going to be here, what does it matter? That, that's, that's in essence what he's presenting. That's the question that he's presenting. There are people who think like this. That, that, that's the observation that he has. And yet, did you catch the statement that he makes? And we'll come back to it in just a moment, where he starts out by saying that our days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle. Hold that in your thoughts. We'll come back to that in just a moment. Here's another observation of Job. It's in Job 10, verses 18 through 21. Listen to what he says. Why did you bring me out from the womb once again? Why was I born? Would that I had died before any eye had seen me. And worse though I had not been carried from the womb to the grave. Are not my days few? Then cease and leave me alone. As though he's talking to an audience. Leave me alone that I might find a little cheer before I go. And I shall not return to the land, and I shall not return to the land of darkness and deep shadow. In other words, his, his thought here is that not only is life short, but his second observation is that since life is short, let me have some fun and have a party before I die. If life is short, party over here. Let me alone. Let me go and do what I want to do. Let me have my way. Let me go out and do what I want to do. Let me take advantage of everything. Let me do even things that are illicit, things that are wrong. That, 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 the idea here, he carries it out. Just let me have some cheer. That's, that's, that's the mindset, not per se to the extent that he's just utterly saying, I'm going to do my thing to the point that it blasphemes against God. Many of us think like that. I'll go since life is short. I might as well cheat on my wife, cheat on my husband. Might as well sow my oats. Since life is short, I might as well drink it up. Since life is short, I might as well get, get high. 
I might as well just, you know, do the things that I want to do and have fun. That, that's, that's the mentality that he says is bred through this observation. I don't want to just die. So since I don't want to just die and I know I'm going to die, I might as well have some fun while I'm dying. That's, that's the idea. Here's the third observation. Look what it says in Job 21, verses 7 through 9. You, you see the mindset? You see the mindset? A righteous man. A righteous man. And yet things have gotten so bad. Notice what he says in this verse in Job 21, verses 7 through 9. Why do the wicked live and reach old age and grow mighty in power? Their offspring are established in their presence and their descendants before their eyes. Their houses are safe from fear and no rod of God is upon them. No judgment comes against them. Why are these things happening? Why, in other words, here's his observation. He's so frustrated with the way that the world seems to work, he's wondering why is there injustice that takes place and what's the meaning of having all of this injustice that is in the earth? He's frustrated. And he begins to cry out. And beloved, again, it is progressive. He doesn't start out like this. It gets, listen, it gets from bad to worse in his thinking. There are three attitude developments that take place within Job. He starts out with the belief that even the bad is cause for blessing. Even bad stuff is a cause to give God blessing. But then he moves from that to this idea that the bad indeed is bad, but it is, not, uh, it, it is to be decried, although it must be accepted, but there's also good that comes with the bad, therefore there must be gratitude. But then he progresses to this thought. He moves to a second part of his development that even the good, listen to this, even the good has never been wholly good or completely good. There was never a real sense of security. There can be no justification, Job believes, for my life. He moves from believing that even in the bad, there is praise to a place of believing you got to take the good with the bad to the place of saying, I don't even believe I should even exist. That's the mindset. Sadly, he's not the only one who holds that observation. Sometimes when we read the book of Job, I don't know about you, but when I look at passages like this, I think to myself, here's my question. How in the world does that minister to me? How in the world does that encourage me? Well, to be quite honest with you, I'm not sure that what we're reading is designed, per se, to minister to us. Sometimes, even in Scripture, even in this text, we find an account that is given to communicate the reflection of one's personal heart or experience. It's not necessarily designed to minister to you. It's designed for us to take a look at it. And it communicates, it shows us what's going on in a person's heart and soul and being at a particular time. It's communicating to us something that is happening within the psyche, within one's thinking. That's why I'm careful, I'm real careful when it comes to experience. You ever hear someone say, you may have said it, experience is the best teacher. Uh, no ma'am, no sir. <laughs> experience is not the best teacher. Trust me on that, I've never experienced crack cocaine and I know it's bad for me. Experience is not the best teacher. Wisdom. Wisdom is the best teacher. Wisdom that comes through having faith in the Word of God and trusting in His Word. You ever hear someone say this? Well, you know, I'm suffering and going through these things because, you ever hear this? Tests and trials come to make us strong. You ever hear that? You said it. Test and trials come 
We make it sound real spiritual, don't we? Tests and trials. Hallelujah. Come to make us strong. If that's the case, then we'd all be Hercules. It's not tests and trials that come to make you strong. It's the wisdom that is applied through faith in God's word while you're in that test and trial that makes you strong. You can go through all the tests and trials and still come out weak. But when you apply God's wisdom through his word, that's what strengthens us. That's what sustains us. That's what helps us. That's what holds us in the times of trouble that we're experiencing. So I submit to you that when a person is suffering, when you are suffering, you and I must be wise enough to know when we are communicating our own personal reflection versus truly ministering to someone. I am not ministering to you by telling you no one knows the trouble I've seen. That's not helping you. What ministers is what I observed the other day when I got a phone call from a 94-year-old woman that asked me to come immediately to her home to see her, not knowing what she was going to tell me as I sat there in her living room. And she leaned over and told me, the doctors have told me that I have pancreatic cancer. And they say that there's no treatment that they can give for me. That's, that's the challenge. That's the test. That's the trial. That's the suffering. But her ability to look at me and take me by my hand and tell me these words. But you know, I believe God. I believe he can touch me and cause me to live to be 100. And if he doesn't, he can call me home and I can go to be with him. That's ministry. I thought I came to minister to him, her, and lift her up. By the time she got through, I was crying, and she was laying hands on me. <laughs> it was ministering to me. I was getting in the car, telling my Lord, thank you for touching me and bringing me here tonight. Thank you for the touch of God on my life. That's ministry. Mi ministry through suffering is when I walk into my tailor last week, and I walk in, and I never knew this about him. I'm standing there, and he tells me, you realize, you realize that I am a bishop. I said, you are? He said, yes, I'm a bishop. And I said, what church? And he told me. And he says, and I, in his broken English, he says, and I was put within a camp, within a prison for 10 years because I would not deny the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm thinking to myself, if that had been some of us, 10 days, we would have been freaking out. But for 10 years, he was in a prison and he sits there and he's standing there with a smile on his face. And he says, but it was for the glory of my God. Amen. That's when you minister despite your suffering. It's a whole different observation. Our own observation like Job, sometimes can become skewed. We observe some of the things that we're seeing today. The tragedy that took place this week that seems to be so common, sadly, of seeing children leave their home. Husbands leave their home. Spouses leave their home and not return. Parents going through daily routine of saying, I'll see you this afternoon not to see their child walk back through the door. That, that, that's an immeasurable suffering. I cannot even imagine what someone this very moment as we sit in this auditorium is experiencing right now. I've sat and held the hands of people afflicted in their bodies with cancer, with AIDS, with leukemia, with brokenness. I've sat and observed single parents that are in despair not knowing how they're going to raise their children by themselves. I've sat and observed spouses that stood before the preacher and said, till death do us part, I do, ate the cake through the rice, 
had the dress, had all the outfit, just to say five years, ten years later, they're going through a divorce. I've sat, as I did on last week, with people who have said that I want to take my life. And I've sat feeling helpless within myself as I've heard even one who was a believer say that what is it worth living? I wish I hadn't even been born. And I have sat there knowing that there's nothing that I can say in my own strength that's going to help this person. I need the wisdom of God that will reach them in the depth of their darkness. I need a word that's going to break through and bring light in seemingly a hopeless situation. And having to listen carefully to the Holy Spirit tell me, shh, be quiet. And tell the person on the other line that you will sit with them on the phone until help comes to take them to the hospital to get observed and checked out. And still tell them, I'm here. Not having all of the answers, but knowing the one who does. Being willing to suffer with them by just being present. I, I, I've, I've seen it. I've seen it in... In 39 years of being in public ministry, the, the brokenness of people's lives, even to see my nephew, who is a flight attendant on, a lead flight attendant on a major airlines, lament over the fact, as he communicated with me this week, that he doesn't understand how it is that a four-year-old will come on a plane and point at him, who is African-American. He's African-American, my nephew. Make no assumptions, because... <laughs> I got some that are not. <laughs> and to point at him, my nephew, and say openly, you are disgusting. And every black face that he sees that came on the plane, a four-year-old, you are disgusting. You are disgusting. You are disgusting. And to see my 24-year-old nephew struggled with that and asked the question, why is there still hate? Uncle, how is it that you can still love people that don't love you? You, you, you follow what I'm saying, beloved? Uh, uh, praying for people to be healed who, who, when I go in the hospital, I say, Lord, this is a good man. This is a good woman. Why do they have to suffer like this? Why do they have to go and lose all of this weight? Why is it that they're not able to hold their food? Why do they have to go through chemo? Why do they have to go through radiation? But God, you are the healer. I believe that you can touch them right now and heal them. And there's times, beloved, that he does. And then there are times they still die. And I'm still trying to wrap my mind around why is it that the good ones die, but the mean ones keep living? Oh, it's a bad pastor. Anyway, I'm trying to figure that out. But Job has a breakthrough. Job has a breakthrough. I don't think he even realizes it's a breakthrough. You and I can see it, and at the time, it may have taken him a little while to see it, but the breakthrough was in the passage we read in Job 7 and verse 6, where he opens up and he says these words in that passage, that life is swifter than a weaver's shuttle. Life is swifter than a weaver's shuttle. In the midst of confusion, frustration, pain in the midst of suffering, God gives a glimmer of light in the darkness that pierces towards Job and says, Job, listen to the words that are coming out of your mouth. Life is swifter than a weaver's shuttle. What is a weaver's shuttle? The shuttle is a tool in which one who weaves fabric, who weaves a garment, places thread within this shuttle 
and threads it through, and the one who is the weaver moves the thread back and forth within the apparatus of the shuttle until it is taken within the loom. Why does God show Job this? Because it indicates this reality that the shuttle is nothing except the hand of the weaver be applied. The shuttle has no life of its own apart from the weaver. Once the weaver places his or her hand upon the shuttle, it may seem that there's somewhat of a chaos or a discontinuity or uh, that which is not uh, 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 flowing. And it seems that the thread is going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. But in the midst of it going back and forth or up and down, it is creating a tapestry. So it is with your life. So it is with my life. The weaver who is, watch this, who is all present. The weaver who is all knowing. The weaver who is all powerful has got his hand on you, the shuttle. And I came to tell somebody without any hesitation, there's still some thread in you. There's some thread in you. There's some purpose in you. There's some purpose in your life. You and I have been designed for the kingdom of God. You are not an accident. You are not a mistake. You are not a failure. God has you here on purpose, for purpose, with purpose. Take it from someone who has told you time and time again, you're looking at a man whom 46 years ago in the segregated South was born in a hospital weighing four pounds and no ounces and doctors telling my parents he will not live because he cannot breathe, he cannot see, he cannot hear. But God said, not so, I have purpose on you and you've got to preach at Bridgeway Christian Church. <laughs> Are you hearing what I'm saying, children? Hallelujah. You're in the hands of the weaver. Maybe that's why Jewish neurologists and psychiatrists and Holocaust survivor who stayed within a death camp for three years, Viktor Frankl, makes this observation. To live is to suffer. But watch this. And to survive is to find meaning of significance. Just waking up this morning makes you a candidate for suffering. But if you can survive it, it makes you aware of your significance. There's a purpose. There's a reason that God has you here. I'll close with these thoughts. Maybe this will help you. We've talked about Job's observation. We've looked at our own observation. But what does God have to say about it? What's his observation? Well, let me tell you what God has to say in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 through 11. He says... These words, God's observation. Uh, on, on my driver's license, there's a little notation on my driver's license that says, uh, required to wear corrective lenses at all times. You and I need this corrective lens at all times in our lives. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time, he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. But listen, resist him. Resist him. How? Firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of sufferings are being experienced by the person sitting next to you and throughout the world. And after, did you catch this? After you have suffered a while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ. What will he do? He himself. When I was growing up, the old folks used to say, he's God all by himself. He don't need anybody else. God himself. What will he do? He will restore you. He will confirm you. 
He will strengthen you and he will establish you. That's what God says he'll do. After, after you've suffered for a while, after you've suffered, after you have suffered for a while, God himself says, I will be so close to you that I'll restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. And did you catch this? The latter part, he says, to him, to him, to God, be dominion forever and ever. It's not about us. When the smoke clears, it's not about how cute you come out looking. When the smoke clears, it's about, God, have you been glorified? Is your name uplifted? Even in the pain, even in the tragedy, even in the darkness, even in the things that I would, that God, I had not had to experience or my family had not had to experience, God, can it be said that when all is said and done, you, just like we just finished singing, you are good. You are good. A few months ago, I was with the apologist, Tim Keller with a small gathering of pastors and recently he wrote this book called Walking with God Through Pain and Suffering. Listen to what he says. When we confront suffering, we think that we will solve it or change it with public policy or the best expertise in psychology and therapy or technological advances. But the world's darkness is too deep to be dispelled merely by such things. It is wrong in our pride to believe that we can control and defeat the darkness with our knowledge. Most of the time, we do not admit how dark the world is. But when tragic events happen, that fact presses down on us almost in an intolerable fashion. And we should not be passive in the face of disaster, tragedies, or injustice. If a change in public policy would prevent a particular form of the darkness from happening again, we should by all means do whatever it takes. And yet it is crucial to realize at the same time that such measures will never be enough. Pain and evil in this world are pervasive and deep and they have spiritual roots. That's why I need what Paul says in Romans 8, verse 18, and then later in verse 26 and verse 30. I need this, beloved, and I state this to you wholeheartedly. Listen to this. For I consider that the sufferings of this present age are not worth comparing with the glory that shall be revealed to us. That's why I've got some help. Verse 26, the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes with us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the heart knows the mind of the Spirit because the Holy Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that those who love God, for those who love God, for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to not my purpose, his purpose. For those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that we might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those that he justified, he also glorified. All things are working together. Everything. It's coming together. Everything. It didn't say all things are good, but when they work together, it's good. Day before yesterday, I went in the kitchen and made a old-fashioned southern banana pudding. Some of y'all don't even know what I'm talking about. <laughs> old-fashioned. I ain't talking about what you see at Golden Corral. I ain't talking about that. <laughs> It's the real deal. And those who know what I'm talking about, it's a process to prepare. I've had some people come and say, I made you a banana pudding. And I took it and it looked like the real thing. Had the vanilla wafers, had the pudding on it, had the bananas popping up on it. I said, it looks real until I ate it and found out they put that old jello box mess in it. That ain't the real deal. <laughs> the real deal doesn't happen quick. 
You got to get in there and take the slow burner and, and, and slowly stir the cream. And, and the cream by itself isn't good. Then you got to take the vanilla and put it in the real vanilla. And you got to put that in. The vanilla by itself is not good. You got to put the sugar in. Sugar by itself is not good. You got to put the eggs in. The raw eggs by themselves, they're not good. You got to put a little cornstarch in to thicken the roux up. That by itself is not good. I'm not too fond of just eating vanilla wafers by themselves. And, and you stir all of this stuff together and then you have to put it together. And I did that. And even the other day when I was doing it, it still didn't come out right. I was not pleased because I leave, left it on the stove too long and the milk started curdling up. And I said, I'm not going to waste my good money. I spent at Rayleigh's to buy all of this stuff and throw this away. I'm going to do something and save the day. And I went and pulled my Vitamix out and poured it in the Vitamix and <laughs> blended it up and it sprung all over the place. And I began to put the thing together. And when I put that thing together and put it in the refrigerator, I took it out 12 hours later yesterday and boy, that baby was was good. Do you hear what I'm saying to you? <laughs> going through what we're going through by ourselves, it's bad. The things that happen are bad, but all things work together for good. All things. Write this down real quickly before you go. This will help you. Let me give you some wisdom points of purposeful living while you're going through, while you're suffering. Some wisdom points. Real quick, real quick. Remain humble. That's where we get the word humility or humiliation. Remain humble in God's power, his strength, and his authority. Like our pastor often says, don't be so full of yourself, there's no room for the anointing. Don't be so full of yourself, there's no room for the anointing. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of a living and a loving God. Number two, insist that prayer is the first course of action. Insist that prayer is the first course of action, not an afterthought but it's what we run to. Number three, resist the temptation to cave in to ungodly behaviors. While you're going through suffering, don't cave in to ungodly behaviors. Resist the temptation. Number four, remember you're not alone in your suffering. You are not alone in your suffering. Number five, lock into the grace of your calling. Believe in the big picture. Believe that there's still thread in the weaver's shuttle. Look to the grace of your calling. Number six, embrace restoration with patience. When God is finished, when God is finished, he will, with all account, he will confirm, strengthen, and establish you, and most of all, restore you. And then lastly, praise God regardless of what it looks like. Praise God regardless of what it looks like. Remain humble. Insist that prayer is the first course of action. Resist temptation to cave into ungodly behaviors. Remember that you are not alone in suffering. Lock into the grace of your calling. Embrace restoration with patience. And praise God regardless of what it looks like. Will you bow your heads with me? There may be someone in this room that you've come today searching for answers, seeking understanding. It first begins with having relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. It does no good to talk about walking in your purpose and God's purpose for your life if you're not acknowledging him as your Lord and your Savior. If you're here and you say, I want to know Jesus. I want to be a child of God. Or you're here and you say, I, I, I need to rededicate myself to the Lord. I'm not walking with the Lord the way that I should. This very moment, it's no accident that you're here. God wants you to know him and he wants to make himself real to you through the cross, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is coming again. And he wants you to be his son and his daughter. You can know him right now. If you've never asked the Lord in your life, or you need to rededicate your life to the Lord, right where you're sitting, no games with you, right where you're sitting, I want to pray with you. Would you lift your hand high right now 
and say, pray for me, pastor. I want to receive the Lord. I want to rededicate my life. Lift your hand up real high so I can see it, and I want to pray for you. Yes, someone else. Lift your hand up real high. You say, I want Jesus in my life. God bless you. Yes, someone else. Thank you. God bless you. Another. Raise your hand real high, and we're going to believe God and pray with you. Thank you. You may put those hands down. You that raised your hand, we're going to pray as a family. And I want everyone to agree with me. This is so special that someone is coming from death to life. Someone is coming from darkness to light. Someone is leaving here transformed, a new man and a new woman. Would you, brothers and sisters, lift your voice and all of us pray with them and repeat these words together. Lord Jesus, we come to you right now with our whole heart. We believe that Jesus died on the cross, was buried for us, rose again, and is coming again. And we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus is Lord. Now everyone say this, Lord Jesus, come in right now. And I declare that you are Lord of my life. I turn from sin and turn to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now give God the best praise you can give him. Come on. Give him the best praise you can give him. Come on. Give him the best praise you can give him. Oh, bless his name. Stand to your feet. You that prayed with us. In just a moment, the prayer team is going to be standing to my right and to my left. I want you to make your way and tell them, I received Jesus today. And we want to get you connected to some studies and the path and missional community, something that will help you in your spiritual walk and growth so that you can grow in the things of God. We want to believe God with you. I've got to let you go, but I want everybody, everybody, lift your hands up so I can speak this over you. There ain't no need to worry what the night is going to bring. It'll be all over in the morning. There ain't no need to worry, children, what the night is going to bring. It'll be all over in the morning. In the morning, morning, it'll be all over in the morning, in the morning, don't give up, morning, it'll be all over in the morning. God bless.